John graduated from DePaul University and received his law degree from IU School of Law, Indianapolis. And um, he and his wife, Angela, live in Indianapolis. And he has two children and two Great Danes. Big dogs. I, uh, I have the uh, enviable task of trying to keep you guys focused on one of the toughest areas of immigration law I think there is out there. Uh, while you eagerly await lunch. So we're going we're gonna to try to see what we can do uh, to make this happen. I'm talking about grounds of inadmissibility, and we're going to go through and try to do some, uh, I think the best way to learn uh, is learning from examples, and I'll try to go through as many cases and examples of situations where you're going to encounter this. Um, when I have new attorneys at my office and I'm trying to teach them immigration law, here's the frustrating thing about learning immigration law. We speak like in code. And I think any profession that you go into, it's almost like they use it as a barrier to entry. So that when you show up on the first day, you feel really, really stupid because you don't know what anybody is saying. So you just have to spend some time focusing on getting over that barrier to entry. I can remember when I went to my first AILA conference back in 1997, and I sat there in the office and I watched all of these really smart people sit up there and say, well, that's a 241A5 issue, and 212A9C, double I, and I'm like, I'm sitting there with the regs and with the statute flipping from page to page, freaking out, like, I don't know what they're talking about. I'm glad I came to this conference, but I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, and so you have to kind of get past that, and I'll try to kind of give you the big picture and simplify it without talking in too much code. But going back and spending some time and learning some of that code is going to be imperative if you stay in this field and you want to keep going. Essentially what my discussion is about is when somebody walks into your office, what do they want? They want an immigration benefit. And they're not going to come in and say, oh, by the way, I have an unlawful presence uh, issue, and I think I have a medical problem, and I have um, a criminal issue uh, that I think is a crime involving moral turpitude that results in me needing a 212H waiver. <laughs> That's never going to happen. What's going to happen is that they're going to come into your office and say nothing about the criminal issue until about three weeks into the representation, or maybe that criminal issue will come out right before you're getting ready to walk into the immigration office for their adjustment I issue, and in the elevator, they'll say, by the way, do you remember me telling you about uh, that uh, arrest I had for uh, criminal conversion? It's only a misdemeanor. That's not going to be a problem, is it? And you're like, you know, it happens. It happens, and so you, you know, that's how these things are going to go. I mean, you're, you're not going to get clients that are going to be able to tell you what their problems are. They're just going to kind of, you got to listen for them. And, and when I used to be at a firm that did a lot of different areas of practices, one of the things one of the partners said is, why do you immigration attorneys spend so long in consultations? Get in there, get it done, and get out. And we kept telling people is, you know, oftentimes it's about hour one and a half or two and a half that you start getting the real story. Uh, my partner and I tag teamed a consultation once because we knew the guy had to have entered on a photo altered passport. But for two hours he swore up and down that no, I'm one of the guy that applied for the visa and I that's my passport. And we're, you know, we've been doing the game long enough that to us, we knew the fact pattern, we knew the country they came from, we knew the circumstances of his background, no way. Either a travesty of justice happened here and the consulate officer was asleep at the wheel and issued that visa, or this guy entered on a photo alter passport. Two hours and 45 minutes, he cracked. He finally said, yes, it was a photo alter passport. You know, here we were about to say, okay, yeah, you're eligible for an adjustment of status based upon marriage to a U.S. citizen. You're in the immediate relative category. So, you know, we can, you got lawful entry. We can run you down here to 950 North Meridian and get you a green card, three to four months. High five, that doesn't happen often these days. 
but we can do that. But what is the fact that he entered on a photo altered passport? What issue does that create? Anybody? Anybody? No, it creates, he didn't claim to be a U.S. citizen, but it creates another ground of inadmissibility. He committed fraud. <clears throat> he obtained entry or an immigration benefit by means of fraud. 212A6. So go back to your statute, and what we're talking about, and, and what I encourage everybody to do, is spend some time with Section 212. INA Section 212. I know it's like boring reading statutes, but you're not going to, you know, as Lee, the guy that was supposed to be up here, uh, somebody that I respect immensely, number one thing that he'll lecture you on, he's one of the best mentors of immigration law that's out there, but he has a lack of patience for people who don't go back and read the statute. You've got to start with the statute and, and really digest what those words say and what they mean. So what we're talking about today is grounds of inadmissibility. That's what I'm supposed to be presenting on. Uh, for those of the, you that don't know, that's all Section 212 stuff. That's why you've got to go to INA Section 212, and you'll start to read all of these criminal grounds of inadmissibility, 212A2. Uh, medical grounds of in inadmissibility, yes, there are certain medical conditions that are going to make you ineligible to get an immigration benefit, whether that be a non-immigrant immigration benefit or an immigrant immigration benefit. One of those recently has been lightened uh, with the taking uh, HIV out of the classification. So it's no longer a medical grounds of inadmissibility, but there are still other medical grounds of inadmissibility that your clients may not tell you about. I didn't find out one. I was recently in an adjustment interview, and uh, we don't always get the medical exams copies from the clients uh, because they're often in a sealed envelope that we have to submit to immigration. I've learned now it's a good idea to get those copies and go through them before you go to the adjustment interview because you may have a medical ground of inadmissibility. Uh, you know, there's security grounds of inadmissibility. Uh, I got this funny video the other day. It was the New Jersey Mafia. That's how we need to solve the bin Laden problem. We need to send a bunch of New Jersey Mafia guys over to take him out because it was this funny YouTube video, the guy walks in and he's gone, we'd walk into this cave and say, hey Ben, buddy, sit down, we need to talk. You know, and it was, but there are security grounds and terrorism grounds of inadmissibility that you're gonna find. Public charge grounds of inadmissibility, meaning that affidavit of support that you have to attach to the adjustment application, they're looking for something there. They're looking for and making sure that whoever is the sponsor or the petitioner for this foreign <coughs> national can demonstrate sufficient income to allow the person to immigrate. So they're, you know, that's the 125% of the poverty guidelines. And there is an entire presentation we could talk for a day on just how to complete an I-864 and half a day to support to ever overcome financial grounds of inadmissibility. Illegal entrance and immigration violators is a ground of inadmissibility. That's your 212A9 section that we're going to spend the most time on today because I think it's the most important. It's the one I think you're going to most often encounter. I feel like pretty much when you have somebody come into your office and they say, okay, I have a criminal history, you're going to know to spend a lot of time on the criminal grounds and go read the section. If somebody comes in and you look at their medical and they got syphilis, you're going to know, hmm, I better go and look at the medical grounds of inadmissibility. But with unlawful presence, it is the most complicated area of immigration law. It's the area that I most often encounter from other attorneys that have even been practicing the immigration law for a long time where they miss an issue where they miss an accumulation of unlawful presence, or where they misdefine what unlawful presence is, or they miss a fact of 245i grandfathering, an exception to unlawful presence. 
and we'll talk a little bit about that and what all of that means. Um, and then there are things that make you ineligible for citizenship and things like that, and those all fall into these grounds of inadmissibility. But today's lecture, the focus, everything that we're going to, is the immigration violators and the unlawful presence. That is the most important thing that you're going to diagnose and that you're going to probably come in contact with when you start representing immigration clients. I trust that if somebody comes in with a prostitution conviction, that's going to ring a little bell in your head and, and clue you into saying that um, I need to do something. And for I gave a handout, one on the front of the cover. I'm trying to get friends, so if anybody is a Facebooker, uh, I'm trying to get people to like me. It's an inferiority complex I have, so if you could help me out with that. We're also going to try to put the video of the presentation, so if you miss something, you can go back and watch it for posterity's sake or something, or you can show it to your friends and laugh. Uh, second page is grounds of inadmissibility. Again, we talk about briefly what some of those are. We're going to be focusing all of our attention on the illegal entrants and the immigration violators. And just so that you have a firm overview, your last two pages is a chart. And I never let this chart out of my sight when I'm meeting with the immigration consultation because you have to know what all of these things are and it's very easily forgotten sometimes that, hmm, I seem to remember that there is something in section 212 that this person may have just touched on that may be a problem in pursuing an immigration benefit and hmm, is there a waiver for that? Well, that's what this chart in the back is, is hopefully gonna do. It's gonna tell you whether it's an immigrant visa application you're talking about or a non-immigrant visa application, and whether it's a ground of inadmissibility, a ground that says, thanks for coming, but I think we're going to pass on you, uh, and whether there is a waiver for that ground, and how you're going to go about applying for it, and what the legal standard is for applying for that. Because once you start getting into waiver work, you realize, boy, that's a whole other can of worms to open up, because waivers vary based upon what the legal standard for requesting the waiver is, who qualifying relatives are to express that legal standard, what the degree of hardship has to be. You get into these terms like exceptional, extremely unusual hardship versus extreme hardship. And then you get into all of this case law of what the gradients or the differences between those two levels of hardship are, and it, it, it really gets to be a mess. But the best thing that you can do is make sure that you identify at the front end in your diagnosis of the case whether they have a ground for inadmissibility in this chart, for me, is invaluable. So, all right. Um, I said we we're going to focus on the immigration violations and the uh, illegal entrance. And the number one thing is this concept called unlawful presence. Uh, what is it? What it isn't? When it starts? When it stops? What sections of law? that we need to really master in order to understand unlawful presence, section 212A9B. If you go to uh, American Immigration Lawyers Conference, that section will be quoted so many times. There's probably no section of immigration law more quoted than 212A9B. Uh, and then INA 212A9C. These are such complicated issues. One of the leading cases that we're going to talk about that just came out was an immigration judge that completely did not know what INA Section 212A9C said, what it meant, nor did the trial attorney representing the government in the removal proceeding completely didn't know what it meant, and they missed it completely. It went up to the Seventh Circuit, and even in the Seventh Circuit opinion, there are misquotes, improper use of language. In the Seventh Circuit opinion that we're going to go through, one of the judges says something about adjustment of status outside the country. You don't adjust status outside the country. That's a right that you only have here. You adjust status here. You consular process when you're outside the country. So this decision, even at the highest federal level here, 
not quite to the Supreme Court, but uh, at a high federal level, we got judges kind of getting some of the terminology wrong. And what's interesting about that case is that the immigration court got it wrong, the Board of Immigration Appeals got it wrong. I think the Seventh Circuit has basically gotten it right, but then now there is a big split in circuits. We got the Tenth Circuit doing something else. We got the Ninth Circuit that tried to do something else. We got the Second and Fifth Circuit wrestling with the same issue. I think we got a pretty reasoned approach from the Seventh Circuit, but we'll go through that. So, and that's where we talk about the recent court decisions. But the key thing is you're going to be wanting to focus on is this difference between 212A9B and 212A9C. Uh, and we'll define what that is. So let's get into what unlawful presence is. You are unlawfully present if, if you are present after the expiration of stay authorized by the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, whatever that means. I don't even know who the Secretary is. Is that Janet? Well, I, I don't know if she's the head honcho that would define that. Or you are present without being admitted or paroled. Do you know who those people are? Come on, somebody don't be afraid to say the word. Iwi, entry without inspection, are our illegal aliens, as Lou Dobbs would call them. You know, our people that are here that didn't get checked in. We didn't look at them and inspect them. Um, those are the people that we're talking about. So this first one is a very complicated thing. And now, where did we get this definition of unlawful presence? That's one of the most important concepts you've got to get your arms around is it didn't start until April 1st, 1997, when we passed IRA-IRA. Somebody smarter than me tell me what IRA-IRA stands for. Illegal Immigration Reform. That's all I know. <laughs> Illegal Immigration Responsibility yeah. Act and Immigration Reform Act or something. Yeah, you know, something. It's this big, massive piece of legislation that passed in 1997 where we got some good things, but we got some really bad things. And the bad thing that we got is 212A9. We got this concept that now if you're here, you can be here accumulating unlawful presence. Now, the district director here at the local office, Don Ferguson, every time I meet with him, he never referred to it as unlawful presence. He said, that's bad time, John. Bad time? I never heard that in the statute. That's what we call it here, bad time. That's the time that you're not supposed to be here. That was his simplified way of saying it. Now, I put these next few slides in here just as something that you can go to. Let me explain to you the history of unlawful presence since it came out in 1997. Nobody has been able to figure it out. In fact, we have written more memos and more policy interpretations of this one issue than probably any area of immigration law. And so if you really want to be utterly confused, go back from the beginning and read them all. Now, if you don't want to be utterly confused, in your packet for $19, it's on sale. How often do you get something on sale? Go buy the official treaties by Lee O'Connor on AILA's website in its entirety used to be $38. I think it's worth about $380 personally. Um, as he says, the article discusses the definition of unlawful presence, authorized stay, but he says in here it even includes every policy exception and all of the reference materials that you will ever need on unlawful presence. And it's only $19. So go buy that. Now, unlawful presence, act applicability, what is it? It only applies to the three and 10 year bars and permanent bars. So meaning this idea that you're going to accumulate unlawful presence, what's, what's bad about it? Well, there's these nasty things in immigration law, these gotchas called the three and 10 year bar and the permanent bar. How bad is it to sit down across a client and say, I goofed, and by the way, now you're permanently barred? You know, this idea of living in the United States, you might as well check that one, X that one off your list, because now you're permanently barred. 
I mean, those are the consequences that we're dealing with here when we're advising clients and they come into our office innocent enough and they sit down and you gotta think quick. You can't put these cases on the shelf and let time go by and then say, ooh, I'm gonna figure it out later because you may be too late and your client may have just gone to a three-year bar, gone to a 10-year bar, or even maybe incurred a permanent bar. And so you have to look at these cases quickly. I just got a case uh, from uh, another attorney down in south of here, way south of here, but been representing this client in removal proceedings. Client didn't really have a lot of options. They got this kind of what I would consider a little bit of a harebrained asylum case filed and they're going to have a merits hearing on this asylum case, which I give maybe a snowball's chance in that word that I'm not supposed to use, but I often do. Uh, you know, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to work, but what really, when I looked at the case and reviewed the file, my issue is, has this person accumulated any unlawful presence? Because if there's no unlawful presence, we got all kinds of options. I can send the person out of the country. I can bring them back in at a different status. You know, this person has, it opens up opportunities. So you always got to figure out whether your client's got unlawful presence as quickly as possible. What unlawful presence is not. If I come in on a visitor's visa and they give me six months, now that little white card, the I-94 card, that controls how long I can stay. The visa may be valid for 10 years. Doesn't mean I can come camp out for 10 years. The white card says I was able to come and go to Disneyland and wherever else for six months. What if I take a job? I violated my status. I violated the terms and conditions of the visitor's visa. But have I accumulated unlawful presence from that point? No, I don't accumulate unlawful presence until my I-94 card expires. A status violation is not going to make you accumulate unlawful presence. So violations of conditions of status or a failure to maintain status as defined by other parts of the act don't make you accumulate unlawful presence. All right, let's say I took a job. I told them I was going to Disney World, but hey, ran out of money. Couldn't pay for that hundred and some dollar ticket, so I went out and I found this job at the 7-Eleven. Am I accumulating unlawful presence? I'm on a visitor's visa, I'm not supposed to be working, but now I'm working. It is a status violation, but am I accumulating unlawful presence? No, not as long as my I-94 card hasn't expired. So, unlawful presence is not the same as unlawful status. I can do things that violate the terms and conditions of my admission. So if I come in on an H-1B visa to work for company XYZ, but I don't like the boss at XYZ, so I go over here and work for ABC, I have technically violated my status. My status only allowed me to work for this company, but now I'm working for this company. I have violated my status, but I'm not accumulating the unlawful presence because my original approval notice and my entry document that they gave me lasted for three years. So I am out of status, and there's a question as to whether I can get back into status, but I'm not accumulating unlawful presence towards one of the bars. So examples of individuals who are out of status but not be accumulating unlawful presence, two big ones are out of status students. This was an issue I was just discussing with my assistant before I came down here. She said, boy, you're taking a pretty aggressive stance on this, this, this lady. She, she, she was a J1 in her DS. Does anybody know what DS entry is? <laughs> it means on that little white I-94 card that you get that the Port of Entry Officer gives you, they mark it D slash S. They don't put a date down there that your status stops on. They put D slash S. That means duration of status. That means as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in that program, like a J1 student, as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, it can go on indefinitely. Well, what's the beautiful thing about that? I can never accumulate an unlawful presence. I don't have an expiration date. Now, I may violate that status. I may stop going to that school and doing what I'm supposed to, but I'm not going to accumulate unlawful presence until what? An immigration judge tells me I'm out of status. When you get an immigration judge that says, student, 
F1 student that got the DF's entry also, you're out of status. And you violated your status because you were delivering pizzas. I was just in court in Chicago and saw that very case. The guy delivered a pizza to an ICE officer. I'm like, how do you get caught unauthorized employment in the city of Chicago for delivering a pizza? He delivered the pizza to an ICE officer. Boom! Now he's in court. Now the judge is telling him, you out of status. Guess what just happened? He started accumulating unlawful presence from those words. So what does that mean? Well, if more than 180 days goes by and he leaves the country then, he's barred for three years from getting any immigration benefit under the Act. Read Section 212A9, three-year bar. If he stays for more than a year past that little interaction with the immigration judge and that finding of being out of status, and he leaves the country for any reason, he's barred for 10. So one of your strategies in that case was, hmm, maybe we should act quickly. Maybe if we should get you out of the country before 180 days goes by, and then you have no bars to applying for a new visa. Now, you still have to go in and explain to a consulate officer who gave you the student visa in the first place that you violated that you deserve another one, but there's no absolute bar. There is no three or 10 year bar against that person. Canadians, anybody ever enter the border from Canada? I had a client once that um, they had a pending adjustment. They weren't eligible for advanced parole. Why were they not eligible for advanced parole? Because they had accumulated, prior to being able to file their adjustment, they had accumulated more than a year of unlawful presence. And again, we're going to talk about how unlawful presence is triggered. It's not triggered until your toes actually touch some foreign soil. You can get a lot of unlawful presence, and as long as you stay in the old U.S. of A., you're okay. But the moment that you touch outside, boom, the bar goes into effect. So if you've been here out of status for more than a year, you've overstayed that visitor's visa, you came in, you told them you were going to Disneyland, Disneyland didn't really work out so well, so you, you ran out of money, you couldn't go home, so you got a job, and lo and behold, five years goes by, and then you meet Cupid. You get struck by love, that love happens to be with a U.S. citizen, Go see the immigration attorney. The immigration attorney says, yes, finally, somebody that comes in that I can file a marriage-based adjustment of status. We can file that I-130, we can file that 485, but you can't travel. You've got to wait until we get done with everything because you can't travel. You've accumulated more than a year of unlawful presence. More than a year. If you leave the country while we're doing this process, you're not coming back you're going to have a 10-year bar. So don't travel. It's the first thing the immigration attorney says. Don't travel. Can't do it. But there's this thing called a travel document. I want one. Mama misses me. I'm sorry. Mama's going to have to wait four months. Because if you travel, you're going to incur the bar. Even if you get the advanced parole and mistakenly apply for it because the immigration service may not catch the fact that you've got more than a year of unlawful presence, they may give you the advanced parole document, let you out, let you back in, and by the way, you get to the interview and they're like, did you travel? Guess what? You just incurred the bar. I had a client that did that. They told me they went into the front of the store in Buffalo, New York and they exited the back door and they were in Canada. Are there any stores in Buffalo area that straddle the border? <laughs> I thought there was like Niagara Falls and a river between the two, but they swore to me, they swore to me that they went in the front of the store and all they did was come out the back of the store. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Gosh, now you got the 10 year bar, now I gotta file a waiver with your adjustment. Now we got our work cut out for us. So, but Canadians, 
they just sometimes just show their passport at the border. They used to be able to just show their birth certificate and gain entry. They got nothing on a little white card that says, you got to be out of here by a certain date. So Canadians are always typically referred to as DS entries. They don't accumulate unlawful presence until somebody tells them, hey, you're accumulating unlawful presence. And usually how they're told that is they apply for something, and in the decision denying whatever they applied for, there's a word in there that says, you are now out of status, and you are accumulating unlawful presence. And then that's when you got to read that and go, oh, we better do something. Now we got a Canadian that's like everybody else accumulating unlawful presence. Unlawful presence, when does it start? Well, after that little I-94 card that the officer gives you when you get off the plane and you skip to the admission and the guy hugs you and two kisses on each cheek and says, welcome to America, and gives you an I-94 card that says when your status is going to expire. So if you're a visitor and he signs it and he thinks you're just swell and he gives you six months, 180 days. Once that expires, you are now into that Don Ferguson area of bad time. You're accumulating unlawful presence. EWI, entry without inspection. These people that sneak across the border that never really want to tell you how they got here, uh, um, they are accumulating unlawful presence from the moment that their toes touch the U.S. side of the border. So immediately accumulating unlawful presence. If they're here for more than three months, or I mean six months, and leave, that's a three-year bar. If they're here for more than a year, that's a 10-year bar. Question? Is there uh, something that you call these people that are from illegal aliens? Um, you know, I've never been one for euphemisms. Um, you know, and... I, I sometimes feel in consultations, I tell them, my clients, if I offend you, let me know and we'll work it out. But I want to make sure that you understand the concepts here. And when you start using, particularly when you're pe speaking to people that are not necessarily speaking your language, uh, you know, I got to make sure that they understand the concepts. So if they say and they use the word illegal, I think they understand what that means. They knew from the time that they crossed over the border, walking for four days or however long it took, they knew that they were doing something wrong, and they knew that maybe there's a consequence to that. Now, now we don't have signs out there that says, oh, by the way, you cross this line and you're accumulating bad time. It's not like speed limit signs. I wish we did put those along the border. I think it would be, make very interesting you know, reading. <laughs> um, but we don't do that. So um, I, um, it is what it is, illegal, unauthorized, uh, whatever word you want to call it, uh, undocumented. They're not supposed to be here and you're accumulating bad time. Let's just go back to Don's word <laughs> and say it's bad time. How do they, how do they prove when you actually cross the border? They ask you. you. You can always tell them. You can tell them something different, but usually, you know, what happens the majority of the times is you're going to learn that clients don't know all of these rules, so they don't really know the implications of the answers to their questions. They don't know that immigration is actually looking for something else. And generally, most of these people are usually pretty honest. I came in in November of 2000. You remember what day? No. Usually, it's just I came in in 2000. Well, was it summer, winter, spring, or fall? You know, because you want to try to pin it down as much as possible. And they'll finally get around to saying, oh, well, you know, I think it was uh, November. And you'll never get the exact date, but now you've got a ballpark. All right, so we've talked about unlawful presence, what it is. Now, what it's not. What about unlawful presence prior to April 1st, 1997? Yeah, I can't accumulate it. So your guy that came in in 1992 and stayed until 1996, he ain't got no unlawful presence. It didn't exist. We created the term in April 1st, 1997 with the passage of IRA-IRA. So no unlawful presence prior to April 1st, 1997. And that's a key thing to remember as we go through some of these scenarios. 
Uh, the statutory exceptions, there are a lot of things that don't mean unlawful presence. So let's go back to this case I, I mentioned to you about the woman uh, down south who had a pending asylum application that I didn't think was going to win. Well, one of the good news about pending asylum applicants, while your application is pending, during all appeals of your application, you don't accumulate unlawful presence. So I had this guy come into my office once, and he is highly, highly educated and a smart guy. He came here on a visitor's visa and filed for asylum. And he had pursued this asylum claim for about six years. All the way through the, the asylum office, immigration court, board of immigration appeals, and he currently had an appeal getting ready that was due to be filed before the second circuit. And he comes into my office for a consultation. And I'm like, Dude, you haven't gotten the message. I don't think you're going to win this asylum argument. And I don't think we're even going to get the stay at the Second Circuit for you to win this asylum argument. And as I'm looking at it, you came in on a visitor's visa and you promptly later filed for asylum. So even though you've been here for, what, now seven years? Guess what? No unlawful presence. <laughs> It just makes me, gets me happy, right? Is anybody else happy? Because the entire plethora of the immigration options were open to us still. So I said, hey, dude, why don't we just get you an H-1B? You've got an employer here that wants to hire you in a professional capacity. Why don't we just get you an H-1B? Yeah, you've got to leave the country. Because there's a difference between trying to get a non-immigrant visa when you're out of status but haven't accumulated unlawful presence. And yes, the consulate that we're going to send you to, they're going to be scratching their heads about this one. They're going to think, well, how were you in the United States for the last seven years and you're not somehow penalized? So that took some work. I had to write a big brief and a big strong letter and said, yes, Pending asylum applicants don't accumulate an unlawful presence. So, lo and behold, we send him out. He gets issued the H-1B visa. Comes right back. Is that, is that what the, the Cuban people come under? Just the Wexford Driveway, where... Well, the Cuban American Adjustment Act is what you're referring to. And that, no. I mean, this is just the running your mill guy fleeing persecution in his home country. And... Well, what he thought was persecution, nobody agreed with him. <laughs> and that's a little bit of a problem, but one of the things that that pending asylum application did is it prevented him from accumulating unlawful presence. Because had he not had that application, and now I had to send him out of the country to get the H-1B, what would have happened? The consulate would have said, well, thank you for coming. Yeah, I see that the USCIS approved your H-1B. Yeah, I see that you got in under the quota, but you're inadmissible because you're standing in Venezuela. And the last time I checked, that's foreign soil. And when I look at your immigration history, you accumulate more than a year in unlawful presence. So I can't talk to you for 10 years. Bye-bye. So do Cubans not accumulate unlawful, or do they just come under an exception based on? Well, Cuban, Cubans are, exception. yeah, it's an exception. Okay. Yeah, and that would be Cuban American Adjustment Act. His visa doesn't matter. I told you that. The visa is just your 10-year key to the door. That just says the visa being issued just as your key to the door. Anytime during the next 10 years, you can present yourself at a port of entry to gain admission. It's that little white I-94 card that controls how long you can stay at the party. Well, he came in as a visitor. The maximum you can get is 180 days. And you can extend it for maybe another 180 days. And if you get some crafty, swindling lawyer, you may get another 180 days. But you aren't going to get much longer than that. I mean, a year and a half at the party, not working, thats you've got to have some resources. You know, if you start asking for more than that on a visitor's visa, I'm wondering how you're staying at the party so long. And how can I do that? <laughs> so, 
asylum applicants, pending family unity, approved VAWA petitions that you guys may get involved in. You don't accumulate an unlawful presence once that happens. Certain victims of trafficking and pending requests for an extension. So when you got your guy that is on a visitor's visa, he was given 180 days to come and be at the party, and he shows up in your office three days before that's expiring. And you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Well, we file a 539 tonight. Why tonight? Because if the Immigration Service gets the 539 before your current status expires, while you're waiting on the answer to that extension, you don't accumulate an unlawful presence. Now, if you wait a day longer and you file that, you better have a pretty darn good excuse at the service center of why you let your status expire because they're technically not supposed to extend or give you a new status if you let the old one expire. Unless you have a really, really good reason. And what you may think is a good reason, trust me, the adjudicator won't. So, apply to both the three tenure bars and the permit bars. Created as a matter of service policy, not a statutory right. So, all of this stuff, unlawful presence, applies to both the three and tenure bars and the permanent bar. Let's get into the details. Some pending applications. If you have an adjustment of status or a registry application, you're not accumulating unlawful presence. I've used that trick. I filed an adjustment for somebody uh, to toll their accumulation of unlawful presence. Uh, extensions and changes of status uh, are, not, are, are no time limit now. Uh, timely to be able to get this, it must be timely filed while in status, non-frivolous, no authorized work, no unauthorized work. So if you get that visitor that comes into your office and you say, let's file that 539 in the next three days so that you don't accumulate unlawful presence, you better ask a few more questions. Have you worked? Have you violated this status? Because all of those questions on the I-539 better be answered truthfully because it's not going to toll the accumulation of unlawful presence likely if it's found out that you filed and have violated before. <coughs> all right, some granted benefits also stop the accumulation of unlawful presence, family unity benefits, uh, a, a grant of voluntary departure from the immigration judge. So. Uh, I've done this one. I've run people to court as quickly as I can to ask for voluntary departure so that we could stop the accumulation of unlawful presence to continue to give us the opportunity to send them out of the country and bring them back with some other form of status. Um, stays of removal, deferred action, withholding of removal, deferred enforcement departure, visa waivers, all of those things can toll the accumulation of unlawful presence. If you don't know what all of those mean, uh, it's, you just got to go look it up and read it. Um, practice pointers. The initiation of removal proceedings has no effect on the accumulation of unlawful presence. Let's read that one again. The initiation of removal proceedings has no effect on the accumulation of unlawful presence. There's an exception to that if you have a pending asylum application. The initiation of removal proceedings is not going to start accumulation of unlawful presence because remember, asylum, a pending application, and its review all the way through the process, you don't accumulate unlawful presence. But just because somebody overstayed their visitor's visa, like the guy delivering pizzas, the immigration judge finds him to be out of status. So now he starts to accumulate unlawful presence, but the immigration judge continues his hearing for a year. Just because he's got a future hearing date doesn't mean he's not now accumulating unlawful presence. As we already got a decision finding that he's out of status, now he's accumulating unlawful presence, and the fact that he's before an immigration judge with an upcoming hearing is not going to change that. So you might want to go back to the immigration judge and say, hmm, we need a faster hearing. Does that apply to the you just here, just crossing the border? They're always accumulating unlawful presence. Right, I know, but but if, okay, so uh, they're detained for a public intoxication case. <clears throat> they're, they're, they're seven years, court hearing a year and a half down the way. Always, 
But, but, but at that point, it doesn't really matter. They already had the 10-year bar. I mean, they already got more than a year. You said they e-weed, and they've been here seven years. They get put in jail for driving under the influence. Doesn't really matter, does it? Well, I mean, he's already got the 10 years. He's, he's already got more than a year. You can't change that scenario. Right, but he hasn't been back. Oh, okay. He hasn't, he hasn't left. He hasn't so left. I don't care how long the, the dance with the judge takes. Yeah, because the longer it takes, the longer my client's likely going to be here. Because in that scenario, how I'm diagnosing that case quickly, I'm saying seven years here, even if he has a qualifying relative, he's not cancellation eligible. There's no relief before the immigration judge other than voluntary departure. We're just trying to buy time, hoping that the law changes. So the kid, so I can't file some type of a cancellation of removal after 10 years? Well, no, he's, his clock stopped towards accumulation of the time that you need to file cancellation of removal the moment that he got served the NTA. That's what I'm saying. Clock stopped. That's now I got, a, I got a dude that's in a bad shape. Yeah. Okay. I'm sitting here before a judge with no options for relief. You told me he was Iwi, so even if he marries somebody and finds Cupid, I can't do anything because he's not adjustable unless he qualifies for 245i. So what am I going to go see the judge about? Voluntary departure. That's all the judge can give me. So if the judge wants to continue the hearing for a year and a half to figure that out, I'm good with that. I'll walk out of there with that rescheduled notice and tell my client I just bought you a year and a half. You know? So, um, nor does filing an administrative to judicial appeal. That's a big mistake that people make. Just because you got an appeal pending, you're still going to accumulate unlawful presence. Unless it's an appeal of the denial of your asylum. Oh, while both a stay of removal and deferred action stop unlawful presence, an order of supervision does not. Um, if you get into these issues, look up stay of removal, look up deferred action, because we're getting into some complicated concepts. And you just got to go look them up and read what the statute says. But you know now, while both a stay of removal, so let me give you an example of what that might be in real world sense. <laughs> All right, I had a guy that was a permanent resident. He got his green card based upon Cupid. He fell in love. He married a US citizen. He married her before April 30th, 2001. So even though he entered the country illegally, in 1997, because that nice wife filed the petition prior to April 30th, 2001, he was 245i eligible. He could prove that he was physically present on December 21st, 2000, so he qualified for the Life Act 245i. Woo! Meaning, we adjusted his status to that of a green card holder, even though he entered the country illegally. Even though he had unlawful presence, 245i forgave that. All right, so now he's a green card holder. A conditional green card holder because he hadn't been married for two years. So what does a conditional green card holder have to do? Well, they have to file this little form two years later that says, ooh, we are still in love. We still love each other. Here's all the evidence to prove it. We don't need a video. We just need joint documents proving that you had a shared life together. All right. Well, he goes to that interview, he files his 751, and he goes to the interview, but a bad thing happened on the way to the interview. She left him. So he gets to the interview, and the officer's like, uh, well, where's your wife? Well, she left me. We were driving here, and she, I slowed down at the stoplight, and that was slow enough, and she jumped out. <laughs> oh, God. So the officer tells him, well, you've got to file a new 751 because we, you know, and I'm not going to get into all the details on whether you file a new one or an old one, but you've got to file a 751 waiver. Well, he forgets. But during that interview, he gave the officer his address, his correct address. I moved. After she jumped out of the car, I figured I can't live with her, but I have a new address. So all right, here's the address. Well, they served the notice to appear after they deny a 751. They serve it on his old address. He never gets it. He gets ordered, removed, and abstention. So now he's accumulating unlawful presence. His you know, green card has now been terminated. 
The 751 was denied. He didn't show up at his removal hearing. He's accumulating unlawful presence. Boom, 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 boom. He gets picked up by ICE. They say, Mr. Barrios, he's reinstatable. He's, he's a, this is the 241A5 case. Go read the statute there, dummy. I'm like, okay, sorry. I'll go read the statute. But before I do that, can I have a copy of his file? Because in his file, we were able to show that the NTA went to the wrong address. Now, he's still accumulating an unlawful presence. That's got to be in your mind. He's still accumulating unlawful presence. Because that could have a bearing on what you're going to be able to do for him if you have to do something different to preserve your options. You're always thinking of, if plan A doesn't work, will plan B work, will plan C work? So you always got to be thinking in every single case, is my guy accumulating unlawful presence? Because if he is, it's going to limit some of your options. The guy from Venezuela could have never gone back to Venezuela to get an H-1B visa had he accumulated unlawful presence because it would have been a 10-year trip. So you've got to be thinking about that. In this particular guy's case, even though he was in removal proceedings, and even though he eventually had filed an appeal, all of that time was unlawful presence time. So immediately once you know that, it does somewhat limit your options. You know if I have to send you out of the country, it's a 10-year bar, is it waivable? Well, he's no longer married to a U.S. citizen. You know, so you definitely don't want to do anything outside of the country, so you've got to pick your fights where you can win. So we filed a motion to reopen with the immigration court, got a stay. They tried to deport him anyway. I made them pull him off the plane at O'Hare. He stayed here. His case got reopened. And we filed that new 751 waiver, late filed, of course. But if the court re-adjudicates, if the service adjudicates that favorably, which they probably won't, they'll deny it. And then the court gets an opportunity to review it. And if the judge agrees that this guy was really married, we're back in business. And he never had to leave the country. No unlawful presence. Well, unlawful presence, but never got the bar. Um, one anomaly in the law is that after removal proceedings are convinced, if an alien voluntarily leaves the U.S. prior to a year of unlawful status, prior to a year of unlawful status. So let's, let's do this. You overstay your visitor's visa, but you've only overstayed by seven months. So technically, you would have a three-year bar. You've overstayed by more than 180 days. You're going to have the three-year bar, right? Right. This is not a trick question. Right. Everybody got that. Why do I want to put that guy in removal proceedings? Why do I want to run him down to the local office and see if I can get a district director or an ICE officer to issue him an NTA and get him in removal proceedings? Because if I leave under a grant of voluntary departure prior to one year accumulation, there is no three-year bar. So they gave me this little six-month window to, to get something done. So that's another, another little trick that you can sometimes do, but you've got to quickly ascertain whether your client fits into that rule. An individual must leave the U.S. after curing the requested period of unlawful presence in order to trigger either bar. That's a good thing to remember. All of the stuff that we're talking about, not into your toesies touch, foreign soil, do you accumulate and have the bar? All right, 212A9B. These are the three and 10 year bars. 180 days. You leave the country after staying at the party more than 180 days past your authorized period of stay or if you entered as a student and the immigration judge has now found you to be out of status and you continue to stay for more than 180 days and you leave the party, you're barred for three years. If it goes to more than a year, you're barred for 10 years. Now, are there waivers? Let's say you goofed. Let's say you got a guy that now has a 10-year bar, and he's sitting back in the home country going, you messed up, attorney. 
I am really mad at you. I can't come back to the United States for 10 years. Can you fix it? And that's where you go to your sheet and you need to find out, is it waivable? Is there a waiver that can be applied that's going to allow them back into the country? Well, for non-immigrants, that's a 212D3 waiver. And, and the good thing about 212D3, it waives just about anything with regard to unlawful presence. Doesn't require a qualifying relative, not very many restrictions. So let me give you an example where I thought something was just crazy use of a 212D3. All right, are you all ready? How many landscapers out there? How many gardeners out there? Nobody? Come on. All right, so you got, you're, you're out working in your yard. You hire somebody to help you. Uh, landscaping company, let's, let's pretend that we're at Mitt Romney's mansion. I didn't know they were illegal. Of course I did. But you're, you're there at Mitt Romney's mansion, and you meet Juan. He's a landscaper. And he tells you that I came to the United States in 1997 in June, and I've been here ever since, and here we are. Here we are in um, 2008. And my boss, Mitt Romney, at the presidential election, it came out that I was illegal. Oh, gosh. All right, so I've been here illegal ever since then. My company comes to me and says, well, we've heard that you can get an H-2B visa. We didn't know this before, but there's this thing called an H-2B visa, a temporary seasonal worker visa. You come in for nine, party, work hard, go back for three, maybe you can do it again next year. So we've decided to try to get you on an H-2B visa to make you legal. So they come to XYZ immigration firm. Anybody have any ideas about whether that's going to work? Any thoughts here? Any concerns about sending Juan back to Mexico to apply for an H-2B visa? He'll be barred. He'll be barred, won't he? How, many, how long will he be barred? 10 years because Juan entered illegally in 1997. He never had status. So every moment that he was here was bad time. He's got more than a year of bad time. And, and Mr. Employer's planning on sending him back to Monterey to apply for this H-2B visa. So he's going to get the 10-year bar. What's the consulate officer supposed to tell Juan? Thanks for coming, but we'll see you back here in 10 years if you can prove that you stayed in Mexico. All right? We all got that, right? Simple case, more than a year of unlawful presence, left the country. And here's where it gets complicated. There are these companies out there that are recommending that these immigrants do this all the time. All the time. Go down there, get the 10-year bar, but they'll give you a visa anyway. Well, how are they doing that? I thought it was the craziest thing in the world until I went and I was at a conference in Texas and the consulate official right there before me said, well, we grant those visas all the time. What about the 10-year bar? Oh, we waive them as long as they're honest. What do you mean as long as they're honest? Well, if they come in and they tell us that that's what they did and they're not trying to say we were never in the United States for the last 10 years, if they come in and they're honest, well, we'll go ahead and issue the H-2B visa and we'll call it a 212-D3 waiver. Can they do that? They can. Would I, as an immigration attorney, ever suggest to Juan that that's a good idea? Probably not, because I don't want him stuck down there for 10 years. I don't want him stuck down there for 10 years, but it is an option, and there is a waiver, a 212-D3. It's right there in your materials. Go read Section 212D3. I don't think Juan really qualifies for the waiver, but somehow the consulate officers in Mexico have come to the understanding that they'll grant those. And so that's sometimes, you know, the law says this, and this is what's going on in reality. And how I learned more about waiver processing, and I do a lot of waiver processing. 
Well, I had the fortune and opportunity to go down to Mexico, and I shot off this email before I was going and saying, I'm going to be in Mexico. Do you mind if I come by the U.S. consulate? Who would have thought you would have gotten an answer to that email? I got an answer. They said, sure, come on by. They sent me a form. I had to agree that I'm not going to have any clients there on that day transacting business. And so I got to meet the head of the consulate in Ciudad Juarez, and she took me to her office. She did me a whole tour of the consulate, acted like I was a client, and walked me from station to station, just as somebody would go through the process. And then we get to her office about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and she says, well, what, anything else you want to see? I was like, oh, oh, oh. I want to see waiver adjudication. Where, 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 did, where, where did the masterminds that decide the fate of waiver people, where, do they, where are they? Where do you got those hit? So she took me there. And it was this little bitty room with four cubicles around the outside and a table in the middle. And she, and, and she said, well, I got work to do. Can I come back and get you later? I said, sure. <laughs> sure. I sat there for four hours asking waiver adjudicators what you're looking for. Guess what? It was drastically different than what the law says. It was drastically different from what the case law says. There are a lot of waivers being adjudicated that we can go out there and read the case law and do all of this. Ain't what they're looking for. I took a legal pad into that little room I did not come out with a single piece of paper that hadn't been written on. Just writing as fast as I can because all, all my question was is, what do you hate? What frustrates you? What do you not like about getting waivers? And they were just unloading as they were sitting there adjudicating people's lives. And I'm just writing like mad. All of these things. And what I came back to the office and reflected on is that there was so much, there is some, yes, they are following the law, but there is so much of what they were doing that wasn't encompassed by even the case law. And, you know, as I was getting ready to leave, I took out my bill phone and I was going to give the guy my business card. And I took it out and you see it's kind of distinct. The letterhead of my law firm looks like the same thing except it looks like this orange down one side and then the tan part gets the writing. As soon as I laid in front of him, he goes, oh. I'm like, Oscar, that wasn't a good O. Oh. And, and then we went in and proceeded into another hour long discussion of what am I doing wrong? What are you not liking? And he said, for the most part, we like some of the stuff you're doing, but can you do things? One of the things, we single spaced our letters. He's like, do you see these glasses? These eyes are getting old. I can't read your stuff. We get 145 of these cases per adjudicator per day. Give me something that's easier to read. Done, Oscar. Whatever you want. If you want it 16 point bold, Times New Roman stretched out, I will give it to you, man. You're, you know, whatever you tell me you want, I'm going to do. And we just had another discussion on and as I walked out of there, I'm like, some of this was common sense. Some of it was common sense. I should have known some of these things. Write for your reader. Understand who the person is over there. Put yourself in their position. I was just at a conference, and attorneys are debating how thick their waivers should be. How thick should your waiver be? better be darn thin. If you want to fast track approval out of CDOT Juarez and you take a telephone book to present your case, guess what you're going to get? Somebody else that's going to look at your waiver later because Oscar ain't got time. So you better learn to write for your reader and you better know what the waiver is all about. So let's in your bars not counted in the aggregate. That's important. So my student who I got out of here before accumulating 180 days. So he's not barred. He goes back, he gets another student visa, and he comes back and he does the same thing, and he's found to be out of status. Does his prior 168 days get added to his unlawful presence now? No. So what does Oscar like more, law or human interest? 
Huh? Well, both. Less law, more human interest. It was very unusual, the things that he considered human interest. I didn't. There were lots of factors that he told me. They consider homeownership a big issue. You know, sell a house. How hard is it to sell a house? Well, at times it can be more hard. I still have one that I can't sell. But they consider that a bigger issue than I ever would have thought going down there that that wasn't a bigger issue in waiver adjudication. Uh, the period of a long full presence is the period accrued during any single stay. So read that carefully. Again, unlawful presence towards the three tenure bar is not aggregate. What about for the permanent bar? 212A9C. Yes, it gets aggregated for that. And we'll talk about that. All right, INA 212A9B applies to any alien seeking the admission with three ten years. We've done that. There's where it defines what an admission is. Let's say you have somebody that comes in on a visitor's visa in, in 2000. They stay for six, well, they were given six months at the border. They stay for, let's call it seven more months, all right? Well, let's call it, mm, let's call it 150 days, not, not 180. So they stay for 150 days, they leave. Well, technically they voided that visa, but the visa says it's valid for 10 years. So they just show back up at the port of entry. They didn't turn their I-94 card in. The officer doesn't see anything in the system and ah, they look normal enough. Go ahead, here's another visitor entry. Well, they had already accumulated 150 days before. This time, they stayed for another 150 days. Now, for the three tenure bar, you don't add those two together. So they've not accumulated a three-year bar. I would argue that they've committed fraud by pre presenting a visa that had been terminated automatically under 222G for having overstayed the, plat the last one, but eh, we'll get around that. And so now they go back, and then they come back in again, and they overstay for another 150 days. Have they done anything wrong here? Have they triggered the permanent bar yet? Because I said we add all the 150s together for the permanent bar, have we exceeded a year? And then come back in? We haven't because they're lawful admissions. Even though they, they shouldn't have been doing it, they were entering lawfully. Now let's say that there's the three entries. We have three different periods of 150 day overstay. They leave, they come back to the port of entry and they get caught this time. And the officer cancels the visa. And now they decide to enter illegally. Now what have they triggered? They never incurred a 10-year bar because none of the stays added together to, to add up to a year. You don't add them for the purposes of the 3 or 10-year bars, but now they have a permanent bar, and how did they get it? They have multiple periods of unlawful presence that exceed a year followed by an illegal entry. They entered Iwi. Officer turned them away and canceled the visa, but they came through the desert and they entered Iwi. Now they have 212A9C problem. They have a permanent bar. Admission and adjustment of status, you need to read that case. Has held that adjustment of status is an admission. The unlawful presence ground of inadmissibility applies to an adjustment of status in the U.S. as well as lawful entry. So let me give you an example of that. Visitor comes into your office and says, I entered on a visitor's visa in 2000. They stayed at the party until 2003. So you know already they've got more than a year of unlawful presence. They left. They came back to the United States, presented that visitor's visa, and got admitted. Okay? In 2005. They got admitted. They were inspected. They got a new six-month mobile I-94 card. 
They marry a U.S. citizen in 2010. Now they're sitting in your office and they want to go do the green card dance. Can you? Anybody? Anybody? Is this person adjustable? Is this person adjustable? Can you run them down and do the green card dance? All right, they entered in 2000, they stayed at the party until 2003 and left. When their first entry, it was on a visitor's visa, a B-1, allowed them to stay six months. So let's say they got two years, two and a half years of unlawful presence. They left. So that would have triggered the 10-year bar. They show back up at the port of entry in El Paso and show the officer that visa that's still valid, and they never talk about staying at the party for too long last time, and the officer admits the person again as a visitor and gives them six months. They now marry a U.S. citizen, and they want to get a green card based upon that marriage. Can you run them down here and adjust them? I'm not sure I would do it in their home country. You can do it there. I'm not sure I would because you're going to give up the opportunity to, to do it here. No, it's not forgiven, and they're not 245I eligible. So no, it's not forgiven because this all, this this whole tra all transpired after April 30th, 2001. So it's not forgiven. Now, can the local office accept a 601 waiver along with that adjustment? That's the question. You now turn to waivers. Is this waivable? She occurred at the 10-year bar. Can you ask for a waiver? Yes. Yes, because the second entry was lawful. May require two waivers if it's an astute INS USCIS adjudicator. And if it were me, I'd probably be asking for two waivers. Why? I'd probably ask for two waivers because I would say that the second entry was fraudulent. I'd, you had to commit fraud. You, you couldn't have been honest. Had you been honest, they wouldn't have admitted you. Your visa was canceled. You presented a revoked visa to try to gain entry to the country. I'm going to say you need a 212A6. So I'm going to ask for an I-601 to waive the 10-year unlawful presence bar, and I'm going to ask for a 212 waiver. And you go to your waiver sheet. Based upon what the conduct that the person is alleged to have committed, is there a waiver? Did they violate a section of law in Section 212, and is there a waiver? I know that this is the most complicated area of law, and I see people's heads going, it is. And I'm going to give you some help to how to figure this out. Skip over some of these slides and get right to the remedy that's going to help you figure this out. So, there is a waiver of the 10-year bar. Now, what if that second entry in that example had been illegal? What if the person had stayed at the party from 2000 to 2003 on a visitor's visa, so they incurred more than a year in unlawful presence, they left, so they got the 10-year bar, they come back to the port of entry, the officer catches them, voids their visa, how does he catch them? He searches their bags and finds a driver's license, or some other library card from 2003 in their luggage. So he says, you stayed at the party too long. He voids the visa. The person's stuck in Mexico now, and they decide to enter illegally. Now they marry a U.S. citizen. Can you take them down here to 950 North Meridian and do the green card dance with a waiver? Why? They got the permanent bar. Why do they have the permanent bar? Because they incurred the 10-year bar and then they have an illegal entry into the United States after it. Waivers are based upon extreme hardship. Extreme hardship, who knows what extreme hardship is. You must have a qualifying relative for the waiver. So we're going to get right to a case that I want you guys to read. I want you to reread it. I want you to reread it. I want you to read it again. And I want you to read it about 20 more times. Uh, because you will literally have to read this case 45 times to understand it, but I'm going to give you a, a, a cheat sheet right now. This is Matter of Lemus, and this is the case that lays out the complicated nature of this problem better than any case that has ever come down. Let me talk to you about what Lemus did. 
Linus came to the country illegally in 1987, or in 1997. And he stayed until 2003. And he left and went back to Mexico for a month. Mom was sick. He felt like he had to go back. He comes back into the United States a month later illegally. And then he gets caught in working somewhere, and he gets put into removal proceedings in Chicago, Illinois, before an immigration judge. And on a notice to appear, they charge him as an alien being present in the United States without authorization, and he's subject to being removed. Standard vanilla notice to appear, all right? Now, Lemus's lawyer says, oh, but wait a second. His father filed a petition for him back in 1992 that is about ready to become current. Filed a petition for alien relative as a 2B category. That means his father was a lawful permanent resident. Lemus never got married, and his dad filed in 1992 for him, and that case is about ready to be current. So the attorney says, he's adjustable, judge. We want to go forward with adjustment of status based upon 245I because he filed that case prior to April 30th, 2001. So he's grandfathered, you know, he's, he's well before, he's actually a pre-Life Act 245I case. He's back in the 1994, January 14th, 1998, 245I case. So he didn't even have to prove physical presence.